Welcome to Defenders, Dr. William Lane Craig's weekly class at Johnson Ferry Baptist Church in Atlanta. For more information concerning the subjects on which Dr. Craig speaks, visit our website at reasonablefaith.org. You'll find articles, compelling debates, audio video downloads, an interactive forum, and many more resources. That's reasonablefaith.org. Kevin shared with me a couple of interesting uh, editorials that had appeared recently in uh, newspapers that I wanted to pass on with you because I thought they were so useful. Very often, people will say, well, what good is philosophy? It's just logic chopping or airy-fairy speculation. It has no good whatsoever. Well, in an article entitled Philosophy, What's the Use? by Gary Gutting, who is a prominent philosopher of science, He makes some distinctions that I think are very helpful in understanding the usefulness of philosophy. He says, if you think that philosophy is something that you have to use in order to establish the rationality of certain foundational beliefs, like belief that the external world is real, or that you exist, or that the past is real and is not just a dream in in your mind, then he says philosophy isn't going to be very useful. These kinds of foundational truths, he says, are widely recognized by philosophers as diverse as Alvin Plantinga and Richard Rorty as being foundational beliefs, properly basic beliefs that don't require any sort of philosophical argument in order to be rational to hold. So he says, if that's the way you think of philosophy, it's no wonder you would think that it is not of any practical significance. But he says there are other ways in which philosophy is vitally useful. And let me quote from his article. He says, even though basic beliefs on ethics, politics, and religion do not require prior philosophical justification, they do need what we might call intellectual maintenance which itself typically involves philosophical thinking. Uh, That is to say, in order to maintain certain beliefs that you have, even properly basic beliefs, you need to be able to answer defeaters of those beliefs that those who disagree with you may bring against them. In order to maintain your beliefs rationally, you need to be able to defeat the defeaters that are brought against you. And he gives this example. Religious believers, for example, are frequently troubled by the existence of of horrendous evils in a world they hold was created by an all-good God. Some of their trouble may be emotional, requiring pastoral guidance, but religious commitment need not exclude a commitment to coherent thought. For instance, often enough believers want to know if their belief in God makes sense given the reality of evil. The philosophy of religion is full of discussions relevant to this question. Similarly, you may be an atheist because you think all arguments for God's existence are obviously fallacious. But if you encounter, say, a sophisticated version of the cosmological argument or the design argument from fine-tuning, you may need a clever philosopher to see if there's anything wrong with it. So intellectual maintenance is one of the things that philosophy can do for us, and particularly for us as Christians, as Gutting's example of the problem of evil illustrated. He goes on to say, in addition to defending our basic beliefs against objections, we frequently need to clarify what our basic beliefs mean or logically entail. So if I say, I would never kill an innocent person, does that mean that I wouldn't order the bombing of an enemy position if it might kill some civilians? He says answering such questions requires making uh, careful conceptual distinctions. And he says such distinctions are major philosophical topics, and most non-philosophers won't be in a position to enter into high-level philosophical discussions. So part of the importance of thinking philosophically is making these sorts of important conceptual distinctions that can help us clarify what we believe and then also see the logical implications or ramifications of what they believe. 
Another article that Kevin and I looked at this week was uh, an article or an interview with the prominent philosopher of physics, Tim Maudlin, uh, entitled, What Happened Before the Big Bang? And Maudlin gives a wonderful example of this use of philosophy with respect to the nature of time. What is time? Uh, Maudlin says that the most fundamental philosophical questions, going back to Plato, are of this sort. What is X? Where you fill in the blank for X. What is virtue? What is justice? What is matter? What is time? He says these are perfectly good questions. And he says um, you, you have some people, especially in the physics community, saying things like time is just an illusion or there really isn't a direction of time. And he says, I think that all of the reasons that lead people to say things like that have very little merit, that people have just been misled largely by mistaking the mathematics they use to describe reality for reality itself. In other words, they have a mathematical model or, or diagrammatic way of representing reality, and they interpret the diagram or the model to be a picture of reality, the way it is in, in, in itself. They aren't able to make that careful conceptual distinction between the two. And so Maudlin says, as to why a physicist would want to hand over time to the philosophers, the answer would be that physicists for almost a hundred years have been dissuaded from trying to think about fundamental questions. I think most physicists would quite rightly say, I don't have the tools to answer a question like, what is time? I have the tools to solve a differential equation. Maudlin says the asking of fundamental physical questions is just not part of the training of a physicist anymore. So it is a good example, I think, of the kind of use of philosophy in making conceptual distinctions, clarifying ideas, and seeing their logical implications that Gutting is speaking of. So Gutting concludes, such distinctions arise from philosophical thinking and philosophers know a great deal about how to understand and employ them. It's true that philosophers do not agree on answers to the big questions like God's existence, free will, the nature of moral obligation, and so on. But they do agree about many logical interconnections and conceptual distinctions that are essential for thinking clearly about the big questions. In this important sense, there is a body of philosophical knowledge on which non-philosophers can and should rely. So I think that's a real encouragement, um, not only to us as just human beings, but particularly to us as Christians who are committed to certain theological beliefs about the nature of God, the universe, moral values, human beings, and so forth, to employ these philosophical tools in understanding what we believe and then also in seeing um, their logical implications as being able to defend it against objections. For more resources from Dr. William Lane Craig, visit our website at reasonablefaith.org. You'll find articles, debates, audio video downloads, and much more. That's reasonablefaith.org. The copyright for this material is owned by Dr. William Lane Craig.